Thank you. Well, thank you, Clive. And thank you, Frank. Uh, and I wish to thank uh, the Center for the Study of Classical Architecture at Cambridge uh, for having me here today. Uh, so you know, what about this book? Why did, why did I write this book and think that it was important to talk about architects as artists? Uh, you know, the, the way architects have always been viewed is, is as artists. And I feel that they should always be looking at the world as artists uh, in a way that we see the world through artist eyes and linking our humanity to the, the physical world. And how today we've moved from a world of representation towards a world of simulation. So I grew up in West Texas uh, where there was a great Indian legend of the great creator who after the creation of the world threw all of his trash into a huge pile in the far reaches of West Texas. Uh, I love these paintings by Dennis Blagg. This painting is in the Fort Worth Museum of Contemporary Art. It's, it's approximately 16 feet high by 32 feet long. And you can stand in front of this. And when I stand in front of this painting, I feel the landscape of West Texas. Yeah, you know, I feel you know, the, the cool wind rushing off the mountain. I smell the ozone. I smell the sage and the sun on the, on, on the back of my neck. Yeah, so this painting is not only visual, but it's a, it's a cognitive impression of the spirit of a place. And so the spirit of the West Texas land, landscape is ingrained in me. It was ingrained in me as a young child. I grew up in West Texas uh, with this idea of who we were, not only as part of our history, but you know, the lore and the mythology of what it was to live in Texas. And you know, that translated down into the buildings that remain today. Yeah, you know, that became who we were as Texans, and it became a part of me as an individual. You know, buildings that were built from the land and were of the land. So in 2022, I was a Robert A. M. Stern visiting professor of classical architecture at Yale. And as that, I had handed each student a sketchbook at the beginning of the semester. Um, at the beginning of the semester, uh, each graduate design class took a trip somewhere in preparation of their design studio for the for the semester and this particular design studio we did a trip uh, across texas some 1400 miles from near the mouth of the rio grande river up through the central hill country of texas and to uh, west texas and el paso um, studying this area that, that I call the land between borders, uh, which was the, disputed for a long time in Texas, and whether or not it was Mexico, whether or not it was Texas, or whether or not it belonged to the Indians or, or any other nationalities. Um, but this area that had this rich influx of different cultures uh, from around the world, from, from the Polish to the French to the English uh, to the, the Mexicans to the Spanish, um, uh, all of these influences colliding with uh, this, uh, this unique landscape and um, resources and the way that they would have to build and translate their culture to this new environment. And so we began this trip by observing and to see and to draw. Now, most of these students had never drawn before. Uh, we, you know, as we all know, you know, a lot of architectural programs today don't even require drawing as a part of their program. So it, we use drawing as a way to begin to understand this relationship of culture and the buildings to the landscape. Uh, even though some of them had never drawn, even though some of them may have drawn, none of them had ever drawn a landscape before. Uh, so this was a completely new experience in trying to understand how, how landscape related to architecture and a way for us to understand place and material and to understand how the twisted tree becomes a lintel and how that lintel becomes a doorway and how that doorway forms a building. So every place we went to, we brought these sketchbooks to help us to understand architectural solutions 
that speak to both culture and to place. Uh, this is uh, young Max Baum's uh, final project at the end of the semester for a cultural center in South Texas. So how did I get my start? How did I begin to try to see as an artist? Uh, this was a painting that hung in my childhood room. Uh, it really had special meaning for me. My aunt had painted this. She she beat up, you know, the the board on which she painted to make it look like it was some, you know, far cast postcard that had washed ashore. Um, but to me, you know, I would dream of these far off lands, and my imagination would go wild, you know, looking at this painting. And later on, uh, this aunt eventually taught me, you know, how to draw and how to paint and gave me my first watercolor kit. I also grew up in West Texas, which uh, was an important oil field in, in Texas. And my parents uh, got this journal that uh, from the company that my father worked for, that was this travel journal of Texas. And it was richly illustrated by Buck Schweitz. Uh, he had these wonderful watercolors of these different historical places in Texas that you could travel to. And again, my imagination for what lay out there in my backyard was, was fueled by these wonderful watercolors by Buck. So what of art? And you know, what does it have to do with architecture? You know, as we look at this 15th century Botticelli, it's our allegorical art. It's a palimpsest. It layers a cultural memory and meaning erased and rewritten time after time. Memories on top of realities, on top of memories. Renaissance on top of Florentine, on top of medieval, on top of Roman. And architecture had always been the same in Europe as a continuum of Rome and its ideas. Here we have a painting by Joseph Gandhi and a scheme by Joseph Gandhi for a boathouse, a boathouse that was meant to look 2000 years old. I felt if I had painted this for one of my clients, my wife would have told me I needed to add some flowers. <laughs> so, so John Sohn was greatly inspired by his fishing buddy, old Joe Turner. That was J.M.W. Turner, uh, who started out as an architectural draftsman and keenly interested in architecture and light and space. And that surely no doubt influenced his friend John Sohn as well. Here, his scheme for his Bank of England. And so Sun was so intrigued by this idea of antiquity, antiquity this palimpsest, that he had Joseph Gandhi paint the bank as if it were in ruins a thousand years from the time it was designed. Little would he know that Herbert Baker would be its ruin. <laughs> so, you know, what a painting in America. And so this was typical of painting at that time in America, that we didn't have anything of our own style. We looked to Europe and Europe's myths and mythologies as a basis of our own art and our, our own identity as a country. So in the 18th century, the age in enlightenment came about, this idea of transcendentalism. Yeah, Immanuel Kent believed we can only have knowledge through those things we experience. Human understanding is based on the general laws of nature. And Descartes believed that consciousness was a reflection of the material world. I think, therefore I am. In 1836, Bostonian Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote a short book called Nature. It became the number one best-selling book in American history. Based on transcendentalism, it foretold that we were all at one with nature and that nature is as close to God as we could come in life. It is nature that instructs us in every moment. In the 1830s, Turner in England began to depart from his ruins towards the dramatic landscapes of nature. Art critic John Ruskin described him as the artist who could most stirringly and truthfully measure the moods of nature. By the 19th century, America began to separate itself from Europe and find its identity 
in its own unique landscapes. The Hudson River School, where human beings and nature coexist, where poetic and artistic inspiration found no impediments, abandoning rationalism for emotion and feeling. Where landscapes rise like great cathedrals into the realms of light, where the daily seems to reside, the deity seems to reside. Primordial image, it was a primordial image of American wholeness. This ideal relationship between humanity and all powerful nature. Nature is God's refuge to the poet hero and the idea that by observing, by seeing, one will know God and one will know truth. America was vast and full of possibilities. And this view of ourselves shaped a nation, a nation of brotherhood, humanity, and ecology. These artists showed the natural majesty during a time of American expansion, searching for the balance between human expansion and the preservation of nature. They saw the manifestation of God in nature. Thomas Moran's painting of Yellowstone so touched the American spirit of who we are it helped to create America's first national park. Painters sought to capture other aspects of our society. Winslow Homer, during the tur turbulence of the Civil War, painted nature in, this, in its force and fury. And the plight of the American slave. And after how we bridged our culture back together as a nation. But it wasn't always about what he was seeing. With Winslow Homer, it was more about a constant and obsessive search for meaning. American architects, American artists carried this tradition into the 20th century. What John Ruskin again described measuring the moods of nature. This intersection of the forces of where the sea meets the land in New England helped form this idea of who we were. The Monhegan main art colony was where artists like N.C. Wyatt, Andrew Wyatt, James Wyatt, Edward Hopper, Rockwell Kent, George Bellows, and others sought that meaning in nature and how that meaning shaped American culture this idea of working with the land. The island attracted many artists, including architects like Abraham Bogdanov from New York, and artists like Edward Hopper, known as the poet of silence, painting the loneliness of a place. Seeing the landscape, not as a collection of objects, but of color. Hopper's aesthetic strategies of synesthesia or cross-century imagery. Is what Walter Wells said, artists had the ability to have us taste what we see, hear what we feel, to give odorful color, melodious flavor, or a chill wind perceived as a wailing siren or quivering blue light. What if architects could think like these artists? Well, English art critic John Ruskin felt they could. To draw is to gain an empirical knowledge, an understanding through experiencing. To draw the leaf was to know the forest. In the mid 19th century, America had no school of architecture. There was no belief systems other than what Europe was doing until Emerson's book on nature. We had architects in the area of Boston one transplant from Boston was John Calvin Stephen, transplanted up to Portland, Maine. His work helped to usher in a new American architecture, one that was based <laughs> on the landscape of this coast. He would not only paint the landscapes for the sake of art, but at almost as a ceremonial seeing of the site. When Winslow Homer wanted a studio in Maine, John Calvin Stevens was a natural choice. Now here we see a painting of 
of Winslow Homer's studio on the coast of Maine. When John Calvin Stevens completed the house for Winslow, instead of sending him a bill, he simply asked him, I would love to have one of your paintings. And Winslow sent him a painting of his studio in the fog as payment. John Calvin Stevens would become central to this new culture of drawing and painting, enthusiastically asking other architects on drawing trips, do you sketch? There will be no shortage of opportunity to improve your skills. Well-known architects like William Ralph Emerson and other Boston architects such as Robert Swain Peabody of Peabody and Stearns. Robert would not only travel around Massachusetts, but up the coast of Maine, painting the different scenes and filling his sketchbook with scenes, scenes of the coast. And then deriving an architecture that was connected to this landscape and to nature. Buildings that so reflected their place that they took on names such as Cragside. And in Boston, this idea that architects should draw formed with America's first architectural school, MIT. Samuel Chamberlain became its first professor of drawing. And you had MIT students become the new American architect. Architects like Arnold Berner, who would later become assigned to the US Commission of Fine Arts. You had other Boston architects like Bostonian Charles Platt, who attended the Academy Julian in Paris and was a member of Stephen Parrish's art colony in New Hampshire, where he painted with Stephen's son, Maxville Parrish. As an artist, he would travel the coast of Normandy, painting scenes of the coast and of his home, home land in Connecticut. He was the first to develop measured drawings of Italian gardens and went to work for Frederick Law Olmsted, the designer of Central Park. Platt would go on to become America's most celebrated architect after he traded his placard from artist to architect. And so this idea of drawing became central to practice in America and the ethos of American practice. Drawing was now ingrained in the architect's culture. Here we have American journals like the Boston Architectural Club and Pencil Points, which became the journals of the drafting room with members contributing their sketches and studies. And learning the language of play through their observations. Here we have the sketchbook of Stanford White on his grand tour with his friend Augustus St. Gaudens, the seeing, the understanding, and the knowing of place. MIT graduate Cass Gilbert, who would go on to design the Woolworth Building in New York, the US Supreme Court Building, and the state capitol buildings for Arkansas, Minnesota, and West Virginia. We had Julia Morgan, designer of Hearst Castle, was America's first woman accepted into the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris. And Julian Francis Abel, the first black American to graduate from architecture school at the University of Pennsylvania. Another University of Pennsylvania grad, John Kell, would end up working for Paul Cray. It's interesting as a young man, when things got slow at Paul Cray's office, it was Louis Kahn who was let go and John Kell that continued on. So my own personal story intersects with John Kell when I moved to San Antonio and was a young architect in a large office. 
John Kell was an older gentleman in his 80s sitting in the back of the office checking red lines on shop drawings. All of this art, all of this past history, this knowing, this understanding was long forgotten. That modern architecture had changed that all. But modern architects weren't always dismissive of drawing. Here we have a drawing of Charles Rene McIntosh. And here, Charles Genere. And of course, we all know Charles Genere as Le Cabousier. And this drawing was at the center of the training of an architect. So as this idea of the American architect continued, it moved west to the west coast. You had Joseph Worcester who built a house on the coast in Oakland, California. By the way, Oakland doesn't look like this anymore. <laughs> uh, but he was inspired by the writings of Jack London who wrote Call of the Wild and his friend John Muir who rescued Yosemite. So Joseph Worcester started a church, the Swedenborgen Church, and built his first church on a hill in San Francisco, working with a young architect by the name of Bernard Maybach. In September 1894, six years after the English Arts and Crafts Exhibition Society gave its name to the movement, Reverend Worcester and his friends established the Arts and Crafts Guild of San Francisco. John Galen Howard moved out from MIT to become the head of the School of Architecture at Berkeley, where he trained Julia Morgan and Bernard Maybach and Mary Coulter, who had become the architect designing railroad hotels across the West that were defined by their spirit of the landscape. Later, you would have Bertram Goodhue, who would move to Boston and become a member of the Society of Arts and Crafts, an art club. Soon, he would depart to explore Mexico. And these, these travels to Mexico would be influenced by his drawings, which in turn would influence his design of the Pan American Exhibition of 1915 in San Diego. His studies of Mexico were obvious influence on his view of regionalism and how architecture could reflect a landscape and a culture of a region. We had artists like George Washington Smith who attended the Academy Julian and exhibited with art artists like George Bellows transplant in California. So many of the landed Californians loved his studio that soon George Washington Smith became one of the most popular uh, architects of Southern California, designing these amazing homes that reflected what would soon become <laughs> the language of Southern California. In 1925, Santa Barbara would suffer an earthquake and be destroyed and would need to be rebuilt. And it was architects like George Washington Smith that would have a major hand on the language of what that town would be and become. You also had architects like Lionel Priest, who as a young man contributed his own understanding of regionalism. But that understanding wasn't just invented. It was an architecture that was influenced deeply by his, his experiences and his travels throughout Europe, and particularly Mexico, and informed by his artist heroes like Georgia O'Keeffe and Martin Hartley. It's a sad story, but... Um, Lionel Priest, who was a dedicated professor at the University of Washington, 
uh, for decades, uh, ended up ending his career when it was found out that he was homosexual and was ousted out of teaching. So what of my own journey? You know, as we have these, these cell phones that we carry, this, these, these cameras that have this endless capability of capturing images, why do I need to draw? You know, what is this, this idea of capture versus a response? To me, to draw it is to absorb it into my memory and make it become a part of who I am as a person and an architect. Sometimes these are very quick impressions, like arriving late at night on the Grand Canal in Venice, and sometimes slightly more study. Sometimes it's just studying a landscape here, parked alongside the road about 30 miles north of Mexico. A black suburban pulled up behind me and two armed van got out and asked me, what are you doing here? They turned out to be border patrol. And I said, I'm just trying to sketch. <laughs> and uh, they let me go about my way. But studying landscapes became important to me and my understanding of where I was to give me an understanding of place. And everywhere I traveled, I tried to paint landscapes as well as the culture. Here in this painting in Provence, I feel the sun on the back of my neck I hear the buzz of the crickets sending an electric current through the fields. Sometimes these are mere impressions in a sketchbook. Sometimes impressions that end up deeply influencing our work. Here we have a library that we ended up building that was influenced by a dove cut coat in France. Sometimes our work is influenced by the drawings of those architects who came before us, like Shepard and Jellico. Sometimes just the spirit of the land. Here we see the deep blue sky of North Texas and the wide open landscapes. And a tower to observe the great Northerners, the storms that would sweep in from Canada over the plains. And so, as you see in this house, the owner had a tower which he could observe these incredibly dramatic storms sweeping across the plains, but be able to run down to his wine cellar and use it as a storm shelter. <laughs> Here is a quick pencil sketch of Rough Canyon, which we were to build a house at and looking out into the landscape of West Texas, and then the study of the home that we were to build and the execution of that home within the landscape. And how these landscapes can influence our architecture as we build in these unique places. This is a fishing lodge on Moosehead Lake in Maine in the house as it got built. Using the stone and the materials to marry it within the site. Here we had, we had taken down an old fishing cabin that was in the place of this site. And under the porch of that cabin, this was this boat that the client wanted to reuse somehow. So we used it as a as a light fixture over the dining table. <laughs> it's a landscape west of where I live in San Antonio. It's about an hour and a half drive west, which is close in Texas, by the way. And the ranch house that we had designed and as it was built. This understanding of the landscape and how we can connect to it. These columns you see are Cypress columns that 
the builder had to have somebody float five out five miles down a river to collect a dozen so we could select just four to be able to use on the house. The great room. And all those, this feels as though it may have been there forever. With the push of a button on an iPad, the entire wall retracts into the sides to expose the landscape beyond. A secret passage down to a wine cellar and art gallery. Library space. And the idea of a small cottage up on the hillside looking down on the valley. And so these landscapes begin to inform our architecture. Sometimes it's merely a view. We see here in this house we designed in Aspen. Often it's how the house settles into the landscape and marries to become a part of it. Here's a quick sketchbook sketch as we're our first visit to the site we were walking around in two feet of snow and eventually the house that was built in Telluride, Colorado. So designed for a ranch house in West Texas overlooking a gorge and a house in California overlooking the Pacific Ocean. It's a recent house that we did in Flintwood La Cunada in California and the realization of that house. And I apologize, these are just iPhone photos here. We haven't had this house shot yet. Here's a house we're working on in Austin, Texas with a series of vignettes giving this, this movie-like impression of how it is to move through the landscape past different structures and towards the main house, past the stables, and then arriving at the main house that sits on the bank of Lake Austin. This is a sketchbook sketch, just sometimes merely, it's an idea of a cypress tree with its roots reaching for the nurturing water of the river and how that character begins to inform a ranch house overlooking the river and its materiality and character. Here's a quick, a quick sketch on the site in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee before we started designing a mountain lodge. And here we see the design of that lodge. Uh, right now we're in design development with this project. Sometimes it's often parachuting into a site late at night on what we call charrettes, uh, quick workshops to get an understanding of a place and begin to, to design in a very quick manner to arrive at an esquisse for a project. This is Spain at two o'clock in the morning to get the creative juices flowing. And then a couple of days later, my design for a neighborhood in a new village. Here's a charrette drawing for housing in Scotland. And Mecca, Saudi Arabia. The Bahamas. But these aren't just renderings, but they're conveyors of a vision. This is for seminary in North Carolina. And here are two different studies. These are by a colleague, Mac White, in our office. An early study of the chapel of what it may appear to be. And then a later study as we are now working on the final phase of the project, which is the chapel. Yeah, you know, so these charrettes can become quick two or three day, sometimes one day workshops. Here we have a quick esquisse done on site with the client 
to simply show them this is this is what's in my head. This is this is how I feel about this project. This is what I feel belongs here on this site. And then later the schematic design for it. And there's a difference between a sketch and a rendering. Here we see a rendering, which is highly technical. Details become more worked out and more developed to end up in forming the final design as it's built. It's a sketch of a house we did in Costa Rica, rising from the jungles above the Pacific Ocean. A scheme for a ranch, a horse ranch in Montana, overlooking Flathead Lake, so arriving at the main lodge. And the main lodge is it sits on the bluff overlooking the mountains of Glacier National Park in the distance. And the horse stables as they sit in the valley behind. A guest cottage. Another charrette for a project in Ohio. Quick impression of what could be. Another project in Delaware. Uh, this was a project adding a conference center to an old DuPont estate. Uh, we re recently had a ribbon cutting just about a month ago with this project. And sometimes just one quick sketch can become something that informs an entire language for a town. Uh, this is a project we were working on for the next phase of Windsor, Florida. And so how do these esquises, these, these general ideas, this ability to have this language of drawing, to be able to have thoughts flow from your mind through your hand to become an idea, develop into architecture. Here we see an initial early scheme for a ranch lodge in the mountains of Telluride and how that becomes further developed, how that marries to the site and to the view, and beginning to develop the plan and the arrangement of spaces and the, the, the forms and proportions of the building to the final scheme. How a set of small boulders may inform a project in Mexico overlooking the Sea of Cortez and how the floor plan ends up becoming this idea of going through and over and around boulders and spaces and on top of the elevation looking towards the sea. Front door in the courtyard and how that plan and its forms get extrapolated into a series of experiences in the house as it was built. The going through and around and on top of and within. So some of you may have heard of some friends of mine. Uh, we had formed during COVID or at the end of COVID, what we call the Whiskey Watercolor Club. And so these architects, uh, good friends, uh, Tom Kligerman from New York, Doug Wright from New York, Anki Barnes from Washington, DC, and um, Steve Rugo from Chicago, all started getting together during our travels and watercoloring together and bringing our sketchbooks to get an impression of the places we were. This is a trip to India. When we all traveled about sketching in our sketchbooks, trying to do more formal studies of where we were and the people and the culture, and then suddenly having that interrupted by the pandemic. And as the president 
began to close down the flights back to the United States. We all decided, well, let's continue to paint together. Let's continue every Sunday to try to reconnect and paint over this new technology called Zoom. And so we would meet on Sundays and we would do things like, how did John Singer Sargent use these bravado brush strokes to imply water or reflected light on the bottom of the bridge? How did he imply a glowing white canvas tent? And so we would look at these paintings and we would copy them ourselves. These are my copies of those paintings. Here we see a Francis McComas and his blocks of color and my copy of that to try to understand composition and color theory, understand how to capture, capture mo movement, such as this painting by Fitz Thalo and all of our different impressions of that painting. And so we would paint together. Sometimes it would be a real scene, such as this blizzard in San Antonio or an object from a shell. We once had the ability during the low of during the lull during the pandemic to all meet up in Santa Fe and paint together again, which was a different experience. Sometimes in the field, you have situations like in Santa Fe where you mix your color on your palette. And before you can apply it to the page, it's already evaporated from the palette. Or in England, where it's constantly raining on you as you're trying mm -hmm. to paint. It's another one in Ireland, just about three months ago. So I had this dream of a studio in Maine where I have a small house on an island where I could paint and begin to study in more detail these, these ideas of landscapes, this dramatic landscape of the coast of Maine. Well, I didn't end up with this studio. I ended up with a small addition to my house that became my studio. But it allowed me to be able to study nature closely. Here's a view outside my studio window of birch trees growing from a moss covered mound or a quarry down the road from my house, a lighthouse around the corner on an island next door or on the way to the island store as the tide washes out in a small inlet, a harbor on the mainland and other scenes but the understanding of how nature can inform structure and form, color and light. This is a small little boat on um, a, a client's island. And on this island, she has a map in her home, in her breakfast room that has like 25 pins on it of different places on the small island, each one with a small little painting pin next to it by N.C. Wyeth or Andrew Wyeth or Jamie Wyeth. This is a rock in the middle of the bay where I live. One of the coastal scenes and the dramatic landscapes that happen in Maine. Sometimes it's just looking at the lichen growing. So in our office, we have this culture of drawing, what we call the MGI Sketch Club, that encourages each member of the office to draw at least once a week, to develop this language of drawing, to continue to inform their way of thinking and being able to see and understand. And so in ending, does anybody recognize this drawing or whose hand this may be? It looks oddly like William Walcott, but this is actually a drawing by AI. <laughs> so yes, 
a computer can be evocative. So if a computer can draw, why do I draw? Here's a site for a new project we have in Santa Fe. And as I sat on the site, I could feel the cool wind from the mountains. I could smell the juniper and sage. I could feel the hot sun on the back of my neck. And I knew how to design the house that would sit in that landscape. And that's, as an architect, why I draw. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.